Good afternoon, and welcome to this week's McGill Alumni Webcast. My name is Derek Kassoff, Managing Director of Communications at McGill's Office of University Advancement. One of the most indelible moments early in the COVID-19 pandemic were scenes of Italians and Spaniards taking to their balconies to serenade their quarantine neighbors with song. As the outbreak spread across the world, we saw members of rock groups, symphony orchestras, and military bands gather together online to deliver concerts to music fans sheltering in their homes. How do we explain these phenomena? Are these musical performances helping us cope with our stress and anxiety? And what does the future look like for the performing arts profession and for the artists and musicians who make their living playing to live audiences? It's Thursday, May 14th, and this is Playing for Time, Music, Musicians, and COVID-19, this week's McGill Alumni Webcast. Today, I am joined by three professors from McGill's Schulich School of Music who will help us understand why so many of us turn to music as a source of comfort and joy and how music can be therapeutic in stressful times. We'll also look at what the future holds for musicians who have been sidelined by the pandemic. Let me quickly introduce our panelists. We have with us today, Professor David Brackett. He's a professor of music history and musicology at McGill, a Canada research chair in popular music and society, a composer and guitarist himself. And among his claims to fame, he once delivered a lecture at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. We have Dominique Labelle, who is an assistant professor of voice at McGill, as well as an acclaimed soprano and recording artist. Among her many achievements, she was the 2018 recipient of Opera Canada's Ruby Award for significant contributions to the opera world. Mm -hmm. And finally, joining us from London, England, Aaron Williamon, professor of performance science at the Royal College of Music in London, founder of the International Symposium on Performance Science, and the Schulich School of Music's Distinguished Visiting Chair in Music for 2019-20. Welcome to all three of you, and thank you for joining us for this discussion. Pleasure to uh, be here. Thank you. Uh, Professor LaBelle, uh, let me begin with you, as I'd like to get a sense of what the landscape at McGill's Schulich School of Music has been like since the pandemic forced the closure of the university's campuses and buildings in the middle of March. Uh, some professors who we have chatted with previously have talked about the successes of moving instruction from traditional classrooms to online platforms, mm -hmm. but I can't imagine this was easy for a faculty where students need to perform in order to learn and to be graded. So can you tell us a little bit about what the transition has been like for music students at McGill? Certainly, I can certainly try. Uh, you're mentioning the landscape. I would say that the landscape is probably close to the Sahara Desert right now with uh, a couple of oases all around. We found out on March 13th, I think it was a Friday that everything would stop the lessons the practice nothing was available no more recitals everything was shut off um, it was a shock not just for the teacher but for the whole school and for the students especially students that uh, appreciate their lessons voice lessons percussion piano violin strings woodwinds and uh, also looking forward to their year-long uh, preparation for their exam. That was a very, very important step to go through as a young student. A lot of master's students, for example, they, they do research, they prepare their program. It takes the whole year to, to present their exam and recital, and it kind of flew up in the air. No way of of showing and no way of performing those, uh, all, all of the energy that was put to recitals and exams. So um, I think for students, it's been quite challenging, quite difficult to live through this period of time where everything seems to fly up in the air. We've been trying very hard to be supportive. A lot of us, a lot of teachers have been in constant contact, communication with our students, giving either uh, some lessons for free and be an ear, be an ear to, to our students, to be able to listen to them, to give them comfort, um, to be supportive in this really difficult time. There were some, um, some, incredible creativity from the whole faculty as to how to manage this crisis, how to make it work, how to evaluate students when there are no recitals, no concerts, no exams. And uh, we opted for, uh, we were able to give students evaluations without their recitals so with conversation, trying to give them a grade so that they can move on and graduate from the school. Great. Well, it sounds like a very challenging time, but I'm glad to know that at least the students were able to 
I guess, essentially complete the semester and, and sort of move on to either graduation or, or the next year. And we'll talk a bit more, I guess, about what that future looks like for, for these yeah. students and for others in the profession. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Brackett, let me, let me turn it over to you now with a similar question. I'm, I'm curious from your perspective, what the past few weeks have been like for your students at McGill, uh, as well as peers of yours in, in your social circles uh, who depend on performing as a source of their livelihood? Yeah, well, the kind of conversations that have been going on really speak to the heart of uh, what it means to be a performing artist, I think. Uh, I was just talking to a friend of mine uh, this morning, and he said, well, what happens in a profession which depends on bringing large groups of people together in small spaces or sometimes large spaces, but at any rate, you depend on bringing crowds of people together, uh, be it in a, a nightclub, a recital hall, a large concert hall. So it really, um, you know, it, it, it's called a lot of things into question and it's, create, it's creating a lot of anxiety and stress uh, for performers, certainly. I mean, my form of employment now is as an academic and I function as a, any, almost any professor would in the humanities and social sciences but um, I'm still in touch with a lot of performers. So uh, the media has highlighted a lot of creative responses and some of the people I've talked to have been a part of these things too, which has uh, revolved around collaboration via the internet in different ways, uh, sometimes making recordings uh, via the internet or even uh, Simu uh, performances that are being coordinated that way. Um, some people have been, you know, uh, it, a lot of it, the uh, success of people has depended on their proficiency with the internet and how savvy they are as entrepreneurs and promoters. And uh, I, th I think people are thinking a lot about how to sort of monetize their musical activities through the internet, but, uh, Obviously, that's that's going to be a huge challenge, and I, I don't know how many streams it takes. I think it takes like a million streams to make twelve cents or something. You know, that's a slight exaggeration, <laughs> but <laughs> it, it's not. It's not like uh, when uh, a couple of people I know have started their own YouTube channels and things like this. But I mean, it takes a huge number of subscribers for that to uh, pay off. Uh, and so there's a lot of questions then also what this will mean going forward when people can circulate again. Uh, will things come back as the, the way they were before, which people are asking in a lot of different uh, arenas. The responses differ a lot too, also according to the type of music people make, uh, which has to do with the use of space. So for example, in classical music, you have recital halls, you have concert halls, um, where it's possible to imagine spreading people out. Um, let's say uh, some kind of limited return to concert making, albeit if you have a hall with 2000 people and only 500 or 400 people can go in, um, how, how much will you have to charge uh, for a ticket? Who can be on the stage? Uh, string players and percussion players, it's easier to imagine them playing rather than say wind players who are spewing large amounts of particles all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, uh, <laughs> that's kind of singers, I mean, Dominique, I don't know. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, uh, you may, you've probably thought about that too. Uh, for jazz players, you depend on clubs where there's a very, you know, uh, it, they're very social, spaces where people are very tend to be very closely packed together musicians are very tightly uh, grouped on a stage so um, it's hard to see how that there can be any kind of uh, um, partial reopening uh, in, in that kind of sphere so I'd say overall there's uh, you know just a lot of anxiety about the future of the performing arts mm -hmm. great and I, I, I 
guess I can only imagine what an opera would be like when the soprano has got to sing with a face mask on, but maybe we won't even, <laughs> won't even go. <laughs> Everyone has to stay, you know, two <laughs> meters apart. But, uh, right. but the other thing is the performing arts have already uh, <laughs> struggling. Uh, I mean, I think creative artists in general have been struggling because of the internet cutting into their revenue in different ways. The recording industry has been uh, on a decline as far as uh, musicians are concerned for probably 40 years now. Um, so there was already a sense of sources of revenue uh, declining. And, you know, this is really catastrophic uh, overall, despite mm -hmm. the fact that people are trying to come up with creative ways of making music. Right. So we'll definitely want to revisit some of those uh, questions that you brought up, particularly around sort of shifting sands in the music profession. Uh, but I, I want to turn to uh, Professor William on now. I guess uh, your your perspective on this or your take is a little bit uh, different in terms of the research that you're doing. I mentioned in the introduction um, how so many of us have gravitated to live music, uh, even during this time of quarantine, whether it's listening to neighbors singing on their balconies or through online concerts stitched together through various digital platforms. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what we know about the psychological and even the biological effects of music and the manners in which it might provide actual benefits for our health and well-being? Yes, well, I, I'm very pleased to be able to join you from London today. Um, <laughs> what we do know is that uh, music is very widely used across the world and very frequently used, and it tends to um, play a, an important role in people's lives. Um, in one respect, when we listen to the music that we love, we can find a way of um, getting in touch with ourselves, getting in touch with other people that may uh, share our views about our tastes and our opinions about music. It's a way to help bring about relaxation, um, to, to help uh, enhance, uh, mood and positive affect. Um, so there, there are a number of ways in which we can engage and do wish to engage with music. Um, and and we're, we're carrying out research, uh, we're both uh, in London and in Montreal, looking at how uh, people are listening, how people are making music and the extent to which this has a direct impact on their health and well-being. Um, the area in particular that I, I like to look at, and, and in our research we have been carrying forward, is the, the role of making music for health and well-being. Um, and what we see there is that when we're looking at different groups within, within society, uh, whether they are um, uh, older adults living in nursing homes or mental health service users or um, uh, cancer patients who are singing in uh, so-called cancer choirs that have been running across the UK, we find that the act of making music can give people a chance to come together with others, to experience something, to, to have a sense of accomplishment, a sense of agency. Um, there's there's a, a a sense of uh, success as well when when performance goes uh, according to plan, so we see a number of benefits that come in. So these are all broadly linked into the the, the psychological benefits that we see, and we can talk more about the the scientific evidence that underpins that. Um, we do see, I and mean, there there is a a, a burgeoning field um, that looks at the the role of making music and listening music on uh, on physical health and biology. Uh, we, there is some evidence to suggest that um, learning to make music over a period of 10 weeks can have uh, uh, some uh, beneficial effects on immune function uh, that last beyond the period over which the learning happens. Uh, it can also be used uh, to um, making music can help to um, uh, um, uh, suppress some stress hormones like cortisol that we see. So. Um, this is a field that we need to do much, much more uh, research and more controlled research, uh, but it's one that we're taking an active interest in because there's, there's a lot of mileage in terms of the many ways in which making, listening and engaging with music can have a direct impact on the psychology and the biology of, of, of people in society. Mm -hmm. So when you say, you know, what we see when we observe these people, you know, performing music or enjoying music, do you mean actually being able to look under a microscope, let's say, at biological markers? So it's not just people reporting that they feel better, but actual biological evidence that things are changing in their bodies that would account for this? 
So um, one source of evidence around this, which I think uh, is still very important would be self-report. So uh, asking people how they feel is, a, is an important component of the, the full phenomenology of health. So that's a very important source of evidence. Um, but, but yes, of course, I mean, we, we, can, um, we can actually take uh, saliva samples uh, in, in some cases, although my team doesn't do that, you, you could look at blood samples too. But you can look at saliva samples and, and uh, analyze those for the presence or absence of um, uh, stress hormones, uh, certain immune cytokines that, that, uh, that you would then compare with other control or comparison groups, or in fact, look in the same people over time to see how uh, the act of making music may uh, have a direct impact on those biological markers. Mm -hmm. So uh, one follow-up question I do have, I know when we spoke earlier, you talked about sort of five foundational characteristics um, to sound mental health uh, and how playing music uh, addresses each of these better than most other forms of activity. Can you explain a little bit about what these, these characteristics mm -hmm. are? Uh, and how the making of music really is the best way to achieve them? Well, um, in the past 20 to 30 years in psychology, there's been a big shift through to looking at uh, not just uh, good mental health as the absence of ill health, but actually being able to thrive and to do well. So it's a, it's a real trend and, and a, a push to look at the positive elements of psychology. And part of that is to, to examine how people live well their quality of life, their well-being. And so um, just a few years ago, there's a think tank based here in London called the New Economics Foundation. And they reviewed the available literature uh, looking at the factors where people who show certain behaviors come through with higher levels of well-being. And the, the outcome of this study that they did was to, to, to produce um, what they call five ways to well-being. Um, which are supported in the in the available literature. So one of those ways is to be active. So be physically engaged and to get out and enjoy the world and take uh, take part in and being physically there. Um, a second way to well-being is to take notice. So uh, notice the the surroundings, your the people around you, um, the the sunset. And, uh, the environment in which you live. Um, a third way to, to be well that we see within the evidence is to give. So give back to your community, give, give to those people uh, who, who you are surrounded by, give, um, give your time, give your energy um, and contribute to society. Uh, a fourth way to well-being is to keep learning. So keep active and staying uh, um, within the game of keeping your mind active and, and keep moving forward. And then the fifth way to well-being, which is coming under particular pressure at the moment, is to connect. So connect with other people. Um, now, obviously, we're finding what different ways of connecting uh, in the current crisis. Um, when we look at our studies, when people are making music, we find that uh, if when when we do qualitative research on the on the benefits they report from from what they're doing, we find that um, we're we're tapping into each of those five ways to well-being very well. Uh, so one of the main questions that you have to ask in terms of the effects, the benefits of music on health and well-being, well, is it music or is it just anything that's social? Well, yes, being we are social animals and being social is going to be very good and, and that will help us to engage in all of these things. But when it comes to looking at those five ways to well-being, it seems that music and making music in particular um, really hits each of those five square in the center and it allows us to sort of um, uh, really make the most of the experience. Mm -hmm. uh, that is really fascinating. Uh, let me just uh, go back to you, uh, if I can, Professor Brackett, um, again, in terms of the research. So I understand that your research focuses on the ways in which music provides us with a source of cultural identity and a sense of belonging. So I'm wondering if you can maybe explain a little bit uh, more about what you mean by that and what your research is trying to uncover. And do these connections apply to all types of music? Are there differences, you know, if you were to compare, say, opera lovers with punk rockers? Um, yeah, well, one of my, uh, one of the things I like to say is that uh, music is a way of making us feel connected to other people. It's also, uh, can be a way we feel disconnected from other people. Um, so uh, let me give a few, a few examples. Uh, the initial premise is that people 
have a sense of belonging, usually to a particular group, demographic group within society, for example, uh, based on gender, race, class, sexual preference, nationality, linguistic group, religion, and this kind of thing. Um, we might feel like we belong to several different groups simultaneously, but uh, the government classifies us that way. And people tend to classify themselves, uh, whether consciously or unconsciously. So uh, it, the way this works with music is particularly obvious, say, with adolescents who uh, often uh, the type of their taste in music as well as in fashion and, and in other areas is almost like a social shorthand for who they are. But I would say that it, it pertains to people uh, regardless of whether they're teenagers or not. It follows us uh, through life. And um, uh, so let me give some examples. It's particularly clear in popular music, I'll say, where we have different uh, categories of popular music that are widely associated with different groups of people. So if I were to mention genres like hip hop, country music, or heavy metal, I think most of us would conjure up images of certain types of people. Uh, um, I used to ask students in my popular music classes uh, what types of music they liked. And a common response would be for them to say, I like all types of music, except for blank. But that except is very important because you think you like everything except heavy metal, but you really detest heavy metal. And you don't just detest heavy metal, you detest the types of people you think like heavy metal. So um, this is part of what I mean. At the same time, there are numerous contradictions because if we say, well, country music people are people who live in rural areas and are, are white and working class, there are plenty of people who participate in country music who don't fit that classification. So that's part of the why I'm interested in doing this kind of research because there's, there are uh, sort of imagined unities that people share in terms of their associations with different types of music. But in terms of what people actually do, it's much more complicated. Uh, I would say it does apply um, equally well to with opera lovers and punk rockers, but uh, uh, the music industry exploits those connections much more with popular music. And uh, because there's a lot more money to be made in it for one thing. So the marketing is much more highly evolved. So yes, there, we know in classical music, for in instance, there are big differences between people who like early music, people who like contemporary music, people who love opera and this sort of thing. But it's not of that much interest to uh, the culture industry because people aren't making very much money from it. Uh, having said, and so uh, having said that, there are broad sociological patterns that mm -hmm. do differentiate people's taste according to a variety of factors. Right. Do, do our musical tastes significantly in, evolve over time? Or like, am I gonna be listening to Green Day in my 80s? <laughs> As an example. <laughs> That's really funny. Uh, well, uh, my experience is people are very strongly marked by the, particularly the popular music they like when they're teenagers. And I think that, that has, for, for many people, that has a particularly strong connection throughout their life. Having said that, I do think people uh, change over time. And uh, um, you may be still listening to Green Day in your 80s, but you might have learned to like other things as well. Uh, Another factor here is just that people's list ways they uh, listen to music have changed a lot over time. And when I was, uh, say, a college student, people would sit around and listen to recordings and listen very closely. And now I think it's often part of some other kind of media experience. Like even non-musicians would 
listen to music pretty closely. And now uh, it's often experienced as part of some other activity or as a kind of adjacent to some other kind of media experience. So mm -hmm. right. that's another factor as well. Yeah. Now, Professor Labelle, I, I, I want to just come back to you. I'm curious, you know, you're a performer, you're a trainer of future performers. I'm curious to get your take on sort of all the science and research behind this music. And wondering if this is something that you and your students are aware of um, conscientiously when you're on stage, when you're performing. Uh, is there a sense that you are not just entertainers, but also therapists in some way? Entertainers? <laughs> We're much more than entertainers. <laughs> Uh, I, I guess that maybe some people would think that we are there to entertain, but I mean, if you are a, a, a knight of music and if you sacrificed your whole life to make music, to study music, to master your instrument, uh, to understand mm -hmm. what a composer meant when he wrote or she wrote little dots on a piece of music, on a piece of paper, uh, you I think you have to find it's, it's a very 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 deep commitment to that art and uh, I, I guess there are all kinds of different ways you can you know think that you're an entertainer I I really consider myself more as a, a sharer of the history of humanity I try to be a, a good reservoir for, for all of that creativity and energy to go through in order to be shared um, with the world. Mm -hmm. So I think as, as artists, it's very important to, to be in touch with our generosity as musicians, our creativity, and also about the importance of, of a musician, which is, I think, very, very hard right now for students to believe that what they're doing mm -hmm. is very important because it's not rewarded financially. Mm -hmm. I don't know anybody, none of my colleagues right now who have no work, no conductors, musicians, all of my colleagues that have no, no work until probably, you know, January, February, maybe next year. There's none of us who have decided to, to commit to music uh, for money. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, as far as the responsibility of a teacher, I think it's very important to to really share that and to share those values with our students. As far as science is concerned, I mean, um, that's, a, that's a challenging topic, I would say, because our art, for example, like classical singing is, is very much based into tradition. So the science has maybe a little bit of a, of a new aspect. Um, Oh, I, my friend, my English gets so bad when I'm a little bit nervous. I apologize. <laughs> but what did you mean about performance science? Because it could mean so many things to so many people. Could you right. be, be, uh, be more specific about what, well, you're, what you're meaning? Or just about when, when you're performing or when your students are performing, yeah. are, they, are they conscientious or aware of the fact that you know they may be having you know their 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 art their performance may be having a therapeutic benefit uh, on the people in the audience. I hope so. I mean, we we certainly share it in even small little studio classes where somebody, uh, when a singer has to sing, they have to connect to their whole emotional life, their mental life, their their life itself. And I think that there's something very rewarding when they see their colleagues or their peers cry or smile or laugh. So I think that we understand the power that we have, the incredible and very privileged power to be a performer. Mm -hmm. So I think that you have to believe that the way you communicate and how you communicate and what you communicate will change the world. I mean, that's that's one mm -hmm. of my main mission, mission as a teacher is to share with my students that they are very powerful human beings. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. So I wanted to sort of you know bring it back to sort of the, the, the experience we're living now, obviously <laughs> in this pandemic and, and you know, 
how it's changed our lives in so many ways. And maybe I'll go back to you, uh, Professor William on. Uh, I know you talked about earlier the, the, the tremendous therapeutic benefits that come from gathering in groups socially, playing music, being part of a choir, you know, but I'm wondering to get perhaps your take now that all of these large gatherings are, are forbidden or, or strongly discouraged all over the world, you know, and there are no more opportunities for choir practice and theater troops or even friends getting together in a garage to, to jam for an afternoon. You know, what, what can we do now if we still want to acquire the benefits of music from the confinement of our homes? Yes, well, let me put a bit of context around this. So uh, I'm running a project at the moment, which is funded by one of the, the research councils in the UK uh, called the Hearts Project. It's the health, economic and social impact of the arts. And last year we ran a large scale survey study with a nationally representative sample here in the UK. Uh, of 5,000 people uh, looking at the what they do in terms of engaging with the arts, um, uh, who they do it with, how much they spend on this, um, and, and how that activity relates over to certain key health outcome measures. So for instance, we, um, we know that when it comes to listening to recorded music, um, 82, over 82% of the UK population is engaging regularly with listening to music. And in fact, over, uh, over 66, 67% of the UK population are, are going uh, on a regular basis to live music in some shape or form. So there's a huge amount of activity of people coming together and also engaging with this art form. Um, we, uh, we, we, we also know uh, through this study and through other studies that those people who are more engaged, we tend to see higher levels of well-being reported and greater levels of social connectedness. So in the UK, um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, the, uh, well, we went into lockdown, we had uh, schools shut and we relaunched our survey that we ran last year to look at how the change in arts activity is happening and what's how this is having an effect on on things like well-being so we're we're still collecting data and i'll say that what i will just about to say i have to contextualize and that we've not that it's not peer-reviewed results but we're um uh, we, we've collected a, a data with, again with a nationally representative sample of 10,000 people uh, we see that the, um, the, the, the things that usually drive arts engagement for the population uh, in terms of the, the things that they, they, they take in, they listen to, they, they go to museums, um, the, what we call the receptive activities, those are gone. So very, very few people are able to engage in that sort of activity, except for things like uh, listening to podcasts and downloads and so on. What we do see actually maintaining quite reasonable levels is this sort of making of music. So people, they may not be making music in groups with others as they were before, but they're still playing their instruments at home. They're still practicing. So we didn't see uh, quite a dramatic drop or any much of a drop at all in that sort of participatory activity. Um, I mean, the question is then, you know, how can we bring this through to more social interaction? How can we get involved with the people? Now, uh, most, uh, uh, the Schuller School of Music, the Royal College of Music as well, a lot of conservatories will have the technology that to some degree will allow musicians at very high levels to synchronize their performances over some distance. Uh, we've been doing a number of projects over the past few years that, that explore and experiment with these new technological approaches. The problem is that those, um, those high-tech solutions aren't really available in our homes. And so a delay of a, of, of a second in our video conferencing uh, display makes all the difference, of course, because you can't have that when you're performing at very high levels and you're trying to coordinate groups of people. But what I've found is that uh, what I found interesting is the way in which musicians are being inventive about um, uh, uh, engaging audiences via different platforms and social media. And of course, the other thing that we can keep doing is we can we can keep learning and teaching. Uh, so a lot of the uh, professional musicians out there are still uh, uh, are trying their very best to run uh, uh, one to one lessons to help people uh, you know, get up to to stay up to speed with their musical skills. Um, so that so one study that we've done in the current situation is to look at how the public health is responding to this in terms of their arts activities. Uh, the other thing that we're doing, and we're 
we're, we're in the middle of data collection now, is that we are running a, um, a survey with professional artists and musicians to look at how the current situation is having a direct impact on them in terms of their finances, in terms of their health and well-being. So um, if I could just give a quick plug, I and mean, we, we're we working with uh, colleagues at McGill, uh, Isabel Cosette, for instance, who um, uh, is helping to uh, um, run the survey in Canada as well. So we have, uh, if, if we have uh, surveys available in Canada, the US, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, um, at the moment only in English, where we're hoping to collect data from professional musicians and artists in terms of how this situation is, is having an impact. So if you go to uh, performance science, one word, dot ac dot uk, on the front page of our center's website, there's a link to the survey for Can Canadians. And from there, if you don't live in Canada, you can click the links to the other countries and take part to tell us how the current situation, situation is having an impact. Mm -hmm. uh, what we do see, for instance, um, uh, according to standardized measures of anxiety and loneliness, uh, of course, um, uh, anxiety has gone up. Um, among the professional artists that we've been uh, sampling. We, we see levels of loneliness go up. Uh, almost to a person, we find that uh, most professional artists um, find that they are under financial hardship. In terms of loss of earnings, um, the, the bulk of the loss is happening within their performance activities, a little bit less so with teaching. And on average, uh, since we started running the survey on the 1st of April, we see that uh, on average, people are losing around uh, 4,000 Canadian dollars. Mm -hmm. And there's almost no prospect for recouping that loss. Uh, so in my perspective, I, I think it's really interesting to see um, what the, how the situation has unfolded because we can then, uh, and to study this carefully, because we'll then have the, the, the information where we can start making a stronger case for other types of support, other types of activities. Um, I'll also, I know that the, the first wave of impact has really come in to have an effect on people who are self-employed and working in the so-called gig economy. It will be very interesting to see what other waves of impact there may be, for instance, with different types of workers uh, when when organizations are coming back after lockdown and some of the the the, the situations around furloughs are translating into other types of uh, employment scenarios. Great. Thank you. Uh, Professor Brackett, uh, speaking of sort of how things have changed in the pandemic, maybe we could talk briefly about sort of music listening patterns. I know you, again, a lot of your research is really focusing on the importance of music to build sense of belonging, cultural connectedness, maybe bonds between parents and their children, as one example. Um, I also realize that we probably spend a lot of our time listening to music while we're driving in our cars, taking public transit, perhaps working out in the gym. Um, and those are all things that are probably happening much, much less frequently than ever before. So are you noticing uh, sort of this sort of just lessening of music as part of our lives, part of our daily lives, and what impact might that have if this goes on for a, for a long period? Um, well, there is some evidence that, say, music streaming has decreased, and uh, for some strange reason, uh, Netflix watching has increased. That was a joke, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Many people have <laughs> commented on watching a lot I more television, yeah. watching yeah. a lot more television than they did before. Um, mm. But it's still curious because you think, well, people are home. Why wouldn't they be listening to music more? And some of it, I think, comes down to what you just mentioned, that many uh, people, I'm not talking about musicians so much as just casual consumers of music, listen to music often when they're uh, commuting, uh, driving, uh, taking public transportation or this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And I noticed too that um, my own listening habits, I tend to uh, listen to music when it's work related, for, related to a project of some sort where I listen very closely. Uh, but then I also would listen closely when I was driving and uh, driving my children around and this sort of thing. And uh, the one time I've done that since the quarantine started, 
my son and I both noted how strange it was that something we used to do once or twice a day, we hadn't done for a month. And we would we go through different patterns of listening to different types of music and talking about it. And I, I suspect that's true for many people that um, that's part of their routine that they're missing. Um, having said that, the streams of the police song, Don't Stand So Close to Me, have gone way up. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> it's their 1980 hit, Don't Stand So yeah. Close to Me. Um, and uh, <laughs> the, uh, and also Spotify notes things like playlists, like the cooking playlist and housework playlist have gone way up. Uh, so, uh, and people have been adding more chill songs to their playlist, which are, I guess, calm songs that um, don't get them too excited. So, uh, that would make sense. Uh, Aaron mentioned uh, streaming live concerts and this sort of thing. And uh, I think those have been very popular. Uh, people are exploring different kinds of collaborations as we've already said, but um, nonetheless, uh, streaming of music seems to be down around 10 to 12%. Some of this may be due to, say, restaurants being closed, which is, uh, you know, they're important clients of uh, streaming services, cafes and restaurants. There have been no new releases, which tend to generate a lot of excitement or many fewer new uh, recordings being released. So uh, those all, all seem to be factors. Yeah. yeah. Now, I want to just turn to you, Professor LaBelle, um, again, mm -hmm. speaking about these sort of online concerts that are being set up across digital platforms, whether it's singers in different countries or, or people playing different musical instruments. I mean, I think a lot of people have enjoyed this and have found a lot of comfort and, and, and joy in, in this. Uh, but of course, all of this is, is being provided to us on these digital platforms for free. And I'm wondering, from your perspective, are you concerned at all that this, over time, might diminish the value of music? Are people going to want to pay for musical performances in the future if everything is coming to them for free right now? I, I see you, you, you think yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think that, that I mean, it's, it's very moving, especially at the beginning of the, the, uh, the crisis. I, I, was, I remember watching on Facebook or on YouTube, people wanting to connect and meet and doing little duets or orchestras <clears throat> making music together and i i thought it was very moving not because it was music but it was because people wanted to meet and make music together i mean if you if you look at what's under the the effort you have to look at the value that's that's being uh, communicated behind the music itself I mean, I, to me, it's very nice to hear this music uh, online, to see how people are making it work, because when you think about recording music, you, you cannot have two people at the same time. There's only one thread of sound. So let's say if I want to sing a, an aria with a pianist, the pianist has to record it, send it to me, and then I sing on top of what the person already has done. It's not like something that is shared in the same moment. It's a little bit separated, but I don't think that that has anything to do with live performances. And I think mm -hmm. um, it's so important for people to, to go and experience music together. And I think, you know, in the end, it will be up to people to decide how important music is, how important live music is. I mean, it's a little bit different than listening to music on, you know, on your, on, in a restaurant or in the car. I'm talking about real performances, real arts performances. I, I don't see how it would disappear because mm -hmm. it is so important. Although economically you cannot see it and people that are uh, making music right now, they have no way of, of making any income. But I think in the long run, it, there's no way that it would disappear because it is so important. Mm -hmm. Professor William on. 
Go ahead. If I can just come in on that, um, you know, I, I think if people want high quality product, then they will go to live performances as well. Um, I mean, the, the act of performing is really very different from the act of um, running through something in your practice room. I mean, it, it's, I mean, the, the end performance will be different. Uh, there was a very nice study in Japan recently that looked at recordings um, of, of recorded studio performances versus uh, live performances. And they played these, these recordings to, other, to audiences and the audiences by far preferred those live performances. And on top of that, you have to bear in mind that the, the place of performance is very important. Um, I mean, these are uh, our, our concert halls, our jazz clubs. These are places where you, again, if possible to come together people th with people, it's a very effective venue in which to do it. People, uh, of course, there's a whole social uh, um, uh, social side of, of meeting together with people talking about the performance you're about to hear or the performance you just heard. So mm -hmm. um, it's a very powerful experience and we seem, seem to be drawn to it. In, in London, for instance, I've read recently that the South Bank Center is the second uh, most visited um, tourist attraction, if you want to consider it a tourist attraction, but it's it's the home of a lot of our live music. And so um, it's important that uh, it's an important play, it plays an important role in the life of the city. Mm -hmm. Great. So I'm um, curious, oh, sorry, go ahead, uh, Professor Brackett. Oh, uh, yeah, I would just like to add that um, I certainly hope everyone is right here and I share uh, their belief in the importance of, of live concerts. I, I mean, I, I think, again, this is also a, seems to be a source of anxiety too, which is there's uncertainty around it, given that there's been downward pressure on uh, the performing arts in general uh, for a long time. And uh, compared to say the pre-recording, pre-radio, not to mention pre-streaming era, uh, 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 there are fewer people go to concerts. I, I read something about the response to the 1918 pandemic in music. And um, there people didn't even really stop giving concerts. I mean, they kept trying and some people would start a tour and have to abandon the tour in the middle because too many people got sick and, and things like that. And then as soon as it was over, people just flocked back to concerts. But this was 1919 and I mean, there were barely any recordings, any radio. So the fact that these things have cut into live performance over time leaves open the possibility that people will uh, see, well, uh, you know, we can, let's say the, the people who are uh, mediators uh, and, and people who make money uh, as mediators of music will say, well, we can make money from this and not have to pay musicians as much. So I, I think there is fear that this will be seen as an opportunity by people to, um, you know, make money without paying musicians. Uh, I think there's fear in academia in general that with online teaching, more online teaching going on, that will be an opportunity to reduce um, expenses in the university and reduce staff and uh, reduce expenses for space. So I think we have to be vigilant. I, I share the hope that these things will come back and I believe in its importance. I just think people have to be on guard that there are other people who are looking to exploit the crisis in a way that might not be favorable to musicians. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really interesting. Um, well, thank you for, for that insight. Uh, I am curious about uh, sort of where the future of music is going, but I think the best uh, way to approach that is perhaps through this question that we received from um, an alum of ours uh, yesterday. Uh, and maybe I'll put this to you, Professor Labelle, to begin, because uh, I think he's writing from a very personal perspective. So this comes from Pablo Aslan. And his question is as follows. He says, my son is graduating from the Schulich School of Music this month. And I wonder what advice and wisdom you can give him and his peers who are just starting a career in music. What would you focus on now, this summer and in the fall, that you wouldn't have focused on pre-COVID? Yeah, I looked at that question this morning because I thought it would be really hard to to answer. It's really, really difficult, and I think we all we all want to support our students the best we can. We we have to have hope 
And that's basically all we have right now is the hope that, that things are gonna get better. I would, I would maybe tell the student to accept the loneliness right now, kind of be okay if, if they can, just to feel that it's, it's okay, it's temporary. Um, and maybe spend time to learn new repertoire, try to focus on things that you wouldn't be able to do if you were busy, let's say, um, you know, doing concert and concert and concert. If there's one thing about doing a lot of concerts, sometimes you don't really have time to learn the music because you go from place to place, one week in, in New York, one week in Washington, DC, one week in Seattle. And as a performer, you have to excel all the time, uh, you know, and, and perform. So I would say, spend time to learn new repertoire, read on different uh, subjects, read about history, read about your instrument, read about uh, stories of great musicians. Sometimes, you know, we're so busy in our studies practicing that there is no time given to maybe a broader spectrum of, of a musical education and musical passion. Um, and do not expect miracles right now. I think that's also probably would be my best advice just to be okay, understanding that most of the whole world right now is in the similar situation. Um, mm -hmm. So, but it's, it's challenging, it's really difficult. And we certainly can uh, sympathize with the anxiety and the the lack of, of, um, of vision ahead. I think it's, it's really challenging, but at the same time, it's an opportunity to, to really center yourself and to find ways to be um, proactive in your career. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So before we, we do wrap up, I would love to maybe just uh, go to our, our other two panelists as well, Professors Bracken and William on, just maybe get some final thoughts from each of you. Uh, some final takeaways, perhaps, in terms of, you know, the current situation, what the future might look like for music. And are there any lessons, perhaps, uh, that one might be able to take away from this experience and this pandemic and this period of quarantine that might, in fact, serve musicians and the music profession uh, well in the future? Um, Professor Williamon, maybe I'll, I'll start with you, if that's all right. Well, um, yes, and, and, and even touching on the question that you had asked, uh, I mean, one thing is for clear, one thing is for certain, and that is that music is a fundamental part of human uh, interaction, engagement and behavior. Uh, we've been making music and listening to music for thousands of years, and uh, there is a role for music and musicians in society, and it's a very, very important role. Um, we know that um, musicians, almost by default have to be inventive, have to be entrepreneurial. Uh, and this is a, uh, an important time to be open to new opportunities. Um, we also know that, uh, you know, we, we, we work with musicians to try to help develop and to prepare them for portfolio careers that involve everything from teaching to performing to uh, engaging in the community. And, um, and it's important to bear in mind, especially for aspiring professional musicians, that there's not one right career path. There are many, many possibilities there. Um, um, and, 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 you know, it, it may be uh, your, your strong desire to get on to the Carnegie Hall stage, uh, but you may in fact find more meaning by working with people in your community, making music with them and for them. Uh, so I would say to, to be open and to, to keep going with that uh, uh, innovative and entrepreneurial spirit, which we know that most musicians uh, musicians have. Great, thank you. Uh, Professor Brackett. Yeah, I'd just like to give a shout out to Pablo there, who uh, I, <laughs> I actually played with Pablo in a, a jazz trio in uh, Santa Cruz, California a long time ago. So he's a very talented, basis and I I just realized his son is graduating as he said from the Schulich School of Music so congratulations to Rafa class of 2020 a unique body of people um, and so just to, to address your question uh, right now the the people who have an advantage are people who are are able to uh, uh, who are internet savvy and who are able to adapt to that environment and who are also, you know, extremely good at 
self-promotion. I think, I mean, that's been true for musicians for a long time. I mean, a few people are able to do uh, specialize in one thing and are very good at it and it just goes the way they think. But for a lot of other musicians, uh, success means being able to be flexible and adapt and match what you can do to what's available to you. And of course, that's going to be true now. Uh, the question is what, what resources are available and what will be available going forward um, and, and no one really knows uh, um, what, what things will be like uh, once, well, again, we're not in quarantine anymore. So, uh, but mm -hmm. that's usually what I tell my students too, who are even before this were worried about what they were going to do. And I'd say the more adaptable and open-minded you can be, uh, the better chance you have. And so I never discourage people from trying to go into a career in music, but uh, I often say you can't just do the first thing you wanted, you thought you were going to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Before I let uh, before I let all of you go, uh, Professor Brackett, I do have one last question I have to ask you. We have about thirty seconds for an answer, but can you please tell us how did you get invited to give a lecture at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and what did you speak about? <laughs> Well, uh, they just called me up. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, no, well, I published a lot of work on popular music. So I guess my reputation preceded me, but uh, I talked about uh, a lot of the research that went into a book of mine that was published in 2016, which had to do with the topic I discussed earlier, uh, the relationship between popular music genres and uh, group identities, basically, and the history of how that uh, changed and developed over time, primarily in the United States. Great, great, well, thank you. I was, I was quite curious about that. Um, so we're almost at the top of the hour, so that uh, just about wraps up the time we do have uh, for this conversation today. Uh, before we close, I'd like to remind you that this video will be available at this very same link soon after our recording ends. So feel free to share it with others who may not have been able to tune in live. And please keep watching your email and social media feeds for more information about how McGill is confronting the challenges of COVID-19 and keeping you informed with insight from our academic, medical, and sometimes musical experts. If you are a McGill graduate who is not currently receiving our emails but would like to be added to our distribution list, you can visit alumni.mcgill.ca slash register to sign up. And that link will be available beneath the video player on the, our YouTube channel. Thank you to everybody as well who filled out our recent survey asking for feedback on these webcasts. We received more than 3000 responses and we'll, we'll be reviewing these closely over the coming days to ensure that we're delivering this information in the best way possible. And of course, a sincere thank you to our three guests, Professors David Brackett, Dominique LaBelle, and Aaron, Aaron Williamon for bringing their voices to this interesting conversation today, as well as to Hugh Topham and Professor Lloyd Chip Whitesell from the Schulich School of Music for helping us arrange for such an esteemed group of panelists. And finally, I do want to acknowledge three people behind the scenes who play such a big role week in and week out in getting these webcasts onto air for us. These are our technical producers, Stuart McCombie and Jonathan Roy, and Taylor Vallée, who manages our digital strategy team at University Advancement. We could not do any of this without, without their incredible support. Please be sure to join us again next Thursday when we explore the legal aspects of the COVID-19 <clears throat> pandemic with three law professors who received special funding from McGill's Emergency COVID-19 Research Fund to study the various ways in which public health protections are being balanced with civil liberties and institutional liability. Now, before we sign off, we did receive an email from Marlene Abrams this week. Not a question, but more of a request. She wrote, I attended a singing competition at Pollock Hall some months ago. The three finalists were two young women, one a high soprano and the other a lovely contralto and a male tenor. I believe the contralto's first name was Jenny and she won. Her voice was so remarkable and she had wonderful poise. It would be wonderful to hear her again. So Marlene, we went into the McGill vault and pulled up a clip of Jenny Ivanova performing at the Worth Vocal Prize in February with Esther Gontier on piano. What a fitting way to end this week's webcast. So please enjoy and we'll see everybody next week. Thank you. <laughs>